Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's, it's the Yo Elliot Don't Show. Die. Yo, bros, we're back with the Yo Elliott Show, and today my guest is Steve Brule. I met Steve at the 21 convention during 2020, and he gave a chilling speech about one world government as a um, associated with feminism and really proposed this idea that the one world government is a feminist-led uh situation and it was eye-opening and i'd love to dive into that concept here with steve steve thank you so much for joining us again here today brother thank you for having me elliot and it was great to meet you at the conference i enjoyed your talk as well you were one of the more powerful speakers there i'd have to say thank you yeah i appreciate it uh 2020 was a uh, eye-opening year for a lot of people and um i had actually come across some of your content right before the event and I learned that things that were happening in the cities with BLM were also all feminist run. Uh, one of your videos enlightened right. me to that. So, uh, you know, I was heavily, that w I was influenced, my talk was influenced by some of the things I learned from you as well. Thank you. Uh, BLM, uh, I did a whole video on um, get to know with BLM. <laughs> it's, an, it's not what it appears, not the boilerplate description. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, um, at least today, it's really kind of, they're, they're enlightened to the facts about it. But back then, it wasn't so obvious. Let's dive into uh, where you began your speech, because it really relates to what a lot of people are waking up to, especially since the pandemic. And that is this idea of a one world government. Now, you know, are we treading the line of conspiracy theory or is this a thing that's really happening? Well, no. Uh First of all, it's not a conspiracy theory. This has been the uh, emperors and pharaohs and leaders like Genghis Khan since the beginning of human history have always sought or tried to unify the world under their rule. So this is not new to our time. This is as old as human civilization. The Chinese emperors, the Japanese emperors tried to make Japan, or at least in their mind, uh, the emperor was to rule the whole world from sun up, sun uh, down, sunrise to sunset, which meant all the known world. But I just want to correct one thing before we go further here. That mm -hmm. your introduction, that I don't think that one world government is a feminist-led thing. I think that it is the uh, it, it it arises from the, the deep human psyche, particularly the male psyche. To there are amongst us men who see themselves as the rightful rulers of the world. And feminism is a a tool or a weapon that they use to help that, to make that uh, to make it easier to bring about, to get control of the rest of the men of the world. Okay. So this idea of a one world government is not new. It's something that I guess all rulers, like you're saying, of all time wanted to sort of establish. Has, has it ever really unfolded or are we as close as they've gotten i think this is as close as we're we've gotten because even the roman empire was limited it didn't make it into uh, you know eastern asia and it didn't get any further west than britain you know uh, it's not, not to my knowledge and if they did some of its minor exploration but the genghis khan again ran up against the uh, uh his ending mm -hmm. fairly early in life but that, that, that they succeed or don't succeed is not really the point hmm. that, uh, in from terms of history. It's that the urge, there are amongst us, uh, there rises men who feel uh, that kind of unsatiable drive to continue to expand their power until, until there's, there's just no more expansion to be had, until they are seen as emperor or ruler uh, of everything. So it's going to rise within us, and I think one day, one way or another, they will succeed, and I think we will live through that period for a time, and then it will crumble under the weight of 
corruption, internal corruption. Because uh, an, an organization, uh, say, uh, without, without um, say, pushback from other organizations will get corrupt eventually, you know. That corruption mm-hmm. will... It's it, my, part of my thesis in that in that respect is that it's it's the existence of other nations that keep each nation on, more honest and well behaved in the world. And when there right. isn't that uh, you know that opponent, it's just it just eventually be, gets more and more corrupt, and the corruption just rocks everything in society. You know. So we saw what looked like a, a cohesive movement during the pandemic, where like the conductor moved his wands and everybody went into lockstep almost every single country i think there were a few you know caribbean i think like haiti and like a couple african countries and then of course in some way the united states because we were still under trump at the time were the only pushback is that correct did it did it seem as if the whole world was under one spell during that time to a degree yeah i mean the the real powerful people of the world they they don't care if there's this little bit of resistance here or there in a country like Haiti you know I mean right they they <laughs> they say some words about we got to help Haiti but at the end of the day they don't they don't really care <laughs> right. uh, they really just want to expand their power base that's the drive of these these their their personal power these kinds of megalomaniacal uh, power hungry men that mostly men that arise among us because uh, uh, men are driven to take some kind of control over the world around but to gather resources to themselves and that's an instinct that that we need to survive you know uh, a man or a group without resources doesn't it die that's the recipe for death so the ultimate end of gaining control of resources is being emperor of the whole world you know? right yeah, and you know, I guess in the past they were nations and states uh, that were led by a ruler that hoped to expand his empire. But today, uh, it doesn't seem as if it's an actual country. It almost seems like you can't put your finger on it. These are like non-government organizations and uh, philanthropists and stuff. Who are these guys that are now uh, trying to unfold this uh, one-world government? Well, you're you're right in that the game has changed. You know, the the, the rise of nation states came after the kind of uh, kingdoms, uh, the rule of kings and uh, emperors and stuff like that. Uh, and then the, with the rise of nation states, we kind of I think we're moving towards the end of that phase, and the game has shifted into global corporations. Mm. You know, the global corporations today. I I, I I'm not. Uh, that's not my personal thesis. I've read of other people's work on this. That uh, global corporations have uh, more power than nations do today. You know, we see that in the lobbying, even of the U.S. government, that powerful corporations can get the government to do to implement laws and uh, change regulations, uh, not at will, but they have a huge amount of influence. You know, so the game for power is played amongst. Is, is played out amongst global corporations primarily and then non-governmental organizations, which are, again, controlled by corporations their, by virtue of their funding and their presence on board of directors and stuff like that. that that's what I, I would say is. Yeah, I can absolutely see that. And we're watching it with, you know, for example, we're in June and there seems to be a cohesive movement to promote the rainbow culture with all of the corporations and so it seems as if uh what you're saying is playing out right before our very eyes here in the month of june like it's sort of i don't want to say off topic but maybe somehow dovetail into you know i don't know how, I, i'm not an expert i don't know for sure but that the united states as it is is a corporation itself and that it's it's almost as if we're not run by a government. We're run by a corporation. Uh, is is that is that so? And you know, if that's the case, is is that partially why maybe we're not pushing back? 
Yeah, I mean, I've heard and read a little bit about what you're talking about, that the the corporation, uh, I think the corporation of the U.S. is uh, 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 how it's dealt with under the original um, law, uh, law of the Seas, or the, not called the Law of the Seas, I can't remember what it's called right now. Maritime? But it's maritime law, I think, uh, and then the relationship with the U.S. with, with other the bodies of the, the time when, when the U.S. was incorporated. But again, I'm way outside of my research zone on that. Um, so I, I'm not sure that that really matters whether we consider, for, for, for the kind of thing I'm interested in, whether we call the U.S. a corporation or we call it something else. At, you know, at, at, at the very least, it is we can classify it as a country in the traditional sense uh, that we're used to calling countries, nations, it's a nation state, or at least a collection of nation states under the federal uh, umbrella. But I, they, I think the most important thing is that where are the decisions being made? Where is the mm -hmm. power really held in the world today? And I, I think that has shifted away from uh, nation states like the U.S. and it's shifting towards corporations. Right. You make some really great points in your talk. Um, you know, when you refer to, I guess, feminism being weaponized as a means by which this one world government seeks to enact power over the you know worker slave of men, kind of a sort of a radical idea. Uh, I like it because <laughs> I can see it. It's like, wow, yeah, that sounds about right. Tell us a little bit about how you use some really interesting terms as well. I, I don't remember them, but maybe you can dive in. Uh, how is it and why are they weaponizing feminism uh, against men to keep us in check? Okay, that's a great question. Um, you know, feminism is just a weapon. So, well, let, let's back it up a bit. The, the ultra wealthy and ultra powerful are wealthy for one particularly important reason is that they have an incredible sense or nose for um, money. Mm -hmm. You know, they and they don't waste any of it. If you ever watch any of those shows like uh, Shark Tank or um, I forget the American one, what it was called, where the investors, uh, people pitch their ideas to investors. Mm hmm. Those guys won't put ten dollars against an idea that they aren't sold on, you know. And these are guys with hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars. They're not going to spend ten dollars. These guys do with their money only stuff that they will uh, feel will pay back for them, will expand their reach, will you know? They're not out there for charity. And yet, amongst the ultra wealthy of the world, perhaps trillions of dollars hundreds of billions of dollars a year are invested into feminist programs. And do you think that that is uh, for charity? <laughs> not a chance. There's not a chance that, the, that they will invest so much of their money into a feminist program. Now, now switching ideas here for a minute. If you are in, uh, look at a bunch of monkeys fighting other monkeys in the, in the jungle, there's sticks, there's rocks, there's branches and stuff. When they fight each other, they'll just pick up anything. Mm. That's an ant. And feminism is a hand. And some uh, pe clever people, they're cleverer than I am. Uh, that's why they're billionaires and multi-billionaires. Mm -hmm. uh, they quickly, I think, saw the power inherent in feminism. And uh, uh, now if you look at what's the result of feminism, they're, they dominated the education system. They are they have made uh, huge inroads into uh, affirmative action, hiring and promoting in business, in law, in uh, government, and uh, in specific cases we could talk about where Strauss Kahn was removed from the International Monetary Fund, and he was re he was replaced with Christine Lagarde, and we're seeing uh, in Malta, for example, Kamala Harris is installed in place to be you know. Democrats for her to be the next president or, or soon to be president of the U.S. In every case, they're trying to seek, rationalize putting women in power over men. 
men are typically uh, reluctant to compete 100% against women in almost anything. You know, I don't, my upbringing, and I think the upbringing of everybody that I, every man I've ever been with, if you go in the ring, you go in the court against a, a woman, you play, you, you back off, you back off a lot, you know. And the, so men tend to defer and allow women to get ahead. Now, now we have uh, women being put over men in the workplace, being put over men in church, being put over men in the hall, in public spaces. Men have to defer to women in all of these cases. That forms like a shield against which the, the people who are funding feminism are protected from the, that huge uh, group of otherwise very competitive, possibly threatening men mm. who now can't rise above this shield of female leadership. Huh. So you're saying in a way we hold ourselves down by deferring to women. And so they're weaponizing our tendency to do so against us. To a degree. I mean, that's not exactly how I rationalize it in the, uh, in the video. I, I think that uh, we've got to come up with an explanation as to, uh, first of all, one thing that feeds into this is that feminism is all about lies built on a, on a stack of lies, and I deal with those lies in the video, The Birth of Feminism. And their core central lie is that uh, men have oppressed women throughout all of history. And that is, a sort of, like, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, men throughout history have typically, this is the overarching art, not to say that there are incidents uh, of, of uh, bad behavior on men's part, there certainly is. But the overarching story, if we are to make one, of men male and female relationships is men protecting and providing for women. That's the overarching story of history. There is no overarching story of men oppressing women. Well, it seems like this is a, a, an ever-present paradigm. I mean, most women, even those who don't refer to themselves as feminists, and a lot of men, I spoke to a so-called red pill man the other day, and they all sort of assume that women were always treated poorly, but now you're saying that's not the case? No, it's a complete lie. Hmm. It was invented in 1848. I mean, they, they even took that lie, uh, in a sense, from the, uh, the Marxist Communist Manifesto, I think, uh, that was floating about the same time or just before the, um, the uh, Declaration of Sentiment, the feminist document, uh, declaring that women, men have oppressed women through all history. Uh, the, the Marxist version is that the bourgeois have oppressed the, uh, the proletariat, the working class, throughout all history, that history was characterized by a ruling class oppressing the working class. That does make sense, you know? I mean, there's an easy argument for that when you look at the, the horrendous way that large groups of men were enslaved and treated and brutalized throughout history used for their labor but they that's the, the idea that was then switched so that that me, all men were considered the bourgeois and all women were considered their slaves and that's just a, absolute nonsense i mean the the most of the the human beings slaughtered and abused through history were male mm. <laughs> they were slaughtered often by uh, and abused by female leaders there were there were uh, female emperors in Rome, you know. There were very powerful women in Rome, and one of the reasons that uh, feminism didn't arise until 1848 is that prior to that time, uh, the politics and war and and work was backbreaking, brutal, murderous affairs. Anybody who stuck their head or nose up into the reaches of power. Very likely to die young and bad. So, by the time 1848 came around, politics was now a civilized sport. It wasn't a blood sport. By the time 1848 came around, warfare wasn't anymore this brutal hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, uh, grotesque, muddy field battles. So much as well. I mean, I'm not saying it, that that right. totally ended, but it, it, the the 
the place in which women say men, uh, time of history that we're talking about here, the lives of men in particular were brutal and hard. And uh, we, we did not <laughs> enjoy, most men, the overwhelming majority of men had next to no power. You know, and even to the point where, if you look at uh, slavery in in, uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, typically a female slave uh, would have been a house servant, uh, and she would have been set free at like about 24, 25 years old, uh, when she's maybe losing some of her looks, and then they, she was set free not for, not for you know humanitarian reasons, but because she was no longer young and good looking, and uh, they 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 would rather their fat her family took care. They want to take care of her anymore. Well, they set her free. You know, uh, it's as a matter of not having that burden of taking care of a young a woman that's no longer in your prime. Whereas uh, a male would have been worked to back breaking labor to 55 years old and then he was set free because they didn't want to take care of an infirm man that can't do any work anymore. Wow. You know, that's a stark contrast to, you know, what we've heard. Uh, especially in terms of the home, like there's this sense that every wife was, uh, or every man was a wife beater and, <laughs> and every woman in her home, you know, was subject to him in a derogatory way. Uh, where does, where does that come from? You know, cause you're talking about you know, rulers and the ruled, but it's really boiled down to r this idea has invaded the home where it's like, well, husband, just by virtue of being a husband, you're perhaps a wife beater. Yeah, feminists want everybody to believe that, you know, they want to, uh, uh, well, I think you could probably look at the birth of feminism for some answers on that, but uh, let's, let's deal with some of the, uh, I don't have my resor my sources at hand on this, but uh, back in, say, early days of the U.S., in a community town where, uh, this would be the time where feminists would claim just what you're saying, that men typically beat their wives and right. it was all socially acceptable. It was never socially acceptable. Not in any time of history. In fact, it was to such a degree that even in the early U.S. and small communities, uh, if a man was accused or thought of beating his wife, uh, the arrest of the men in the community would beat him half to death, huh. if not to death. You know? So there was clearly no point in history where generally men thought it was okay to Facts. Well, now we have a situation today where it's pretty normalized for w women to be uh, angry uh, and hateful towards men. How did we get to this place where, like, the entire culture seems to have bought this narrative? Well, it's been shoved down our throats for 160 years. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, we grew up with it. It, it started. Uh, well, it probably started before 1848. I like the date 1848 only because that was when the Declaration of Sentiments was, you know, found, uh, it's created and signed and stuff like that. And uh, so that becomes a useful, as good as any starting point for the modern feminist movement. Now, a lot of people will, will debate that date. But, you know, um, uh, throughout my life, the feminists have been putting stuff out like hate, uh, like kill all men, you know, all men are rapists, mm -hmm. uh, all PIV, yeah, I'm sure you heard the term PIV, sex is rape, you know, uh, reduce the male population to 10%, call the male population. All of these are feminist ideas. And these are ideas that, that could not be floated against any other group in Western culture, uh, without being just the person being completely uh, removed from civil society, you know, ridiculed to the point you can't show your face in public. But feminists do this, and then they're celebrated, you know? Right. And so the long arm of feminism has creeped into all, I guess you could call it uh, transsectionality. Transsec is that correct? Intersectionality. Intersectionality. What is intersectionality uh, as a form of feminism, if I'm understanding correct? Yeah, feminists uh, 
coined the term intersectional feminism to represent the idea that there are multiple uh, identities of uh, oppression. So you can be oppressed for being black, you can be oppressed for being female, you can be oppressed for being uh, lesbian, and then, you know, they stack up all these oppressions and they rank each other in a sense in how oppressed you are. It's the, the victim Olympics, right? And so intersectionality is just the idea that all of these different parts of your identity um, intersect with each other and add up to even more oppression, which means even more privilege and compensation for your horrible oppressed right a lot of privilege it, it it's strange a lot of ugliness <laughs> unfortunately i mean i just gotta call it for what it is is being celebrated as beauty today for example you know a lot of these models right they're obese just big ugly women yeah. who are who are celebrated as as being brave is this a form of intersectional uh feminism I suppose. I think they're claiming that, uh, you know, not being beautiful is uh, another identity in which you are, you suffer for in society. I mean, it's not exactly wrong. I'm, I'm not six foot four. I guess I suffer for that if I really want to, you know, turn myself into a victim, you know? I mean, yeah, except you're a white man. And I'm a white man. So now I'm privileged. So I can't be a victim. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> It's it's a uh, it's a head game that's uh, really destructive, personally destructive and socially destructive. You know, we're focused on um, kind of superficial qualities and victimization instead of like traditional values where uh, virtues, uh, hard work, uh, resilience, um, contribution to society, which we should be celebrating. Those are legitimate things to celebrate. There are things within your control, you know. I mean, you 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 didn't decide to be be born black or white or whatever. I didn't decide to even be born male. I I was born with these identities, you know. But what uh, I think traditional traditionally we would have celebrated a person's achievements, right. a person's dedication to family, to work, to various things like that. Those are legitimately celebratory things. You know, and it, uh, to be honest, like there are legitimate forms of victimization. For instance, if you were walking down the street, some uh, strung out drug dealer came up with you the baseball bat and knocked your brain out. And now you're, you, you've got problems. You're, you're a legitimate victim. And, you know, society should uh, help you out. And because in recognition of the fact that uh, you know, this was doing it, literally victimized but you know you're not victimized by be going being born female you're not or male you know yet you are i mean i I'll, I'll qualify that a little bit we're not all born equal some of us have are born with incredible talents and born into wealthy circumstances that's that's all uh, good and bad whatever it is it's neither good nor bad it just is it's going to be like is going to, it should be how we determine uh, you know, the value of a uh, person to society, for instance, and their status should be connected to what you do with your life, the life you're given. So I'd like to return for a moment to this idea that feminism is being used as a means to control the population. You said something, <laughs> you know, in your talk that struck my heart. Uh, I've been married for over 20 years. I married my high school girlfriend and uh, we have a great relationship. You mentioned that the marriage, you know, uh, marriage has sort of been weaponized and that every, every man essentially has a domestic slave owner <laughs> in his wife, something to that effect. How is that? Uh, explain how marriage has been weaponized as a means by which to keep men in check. Yo, it's your bro Elliot Hulse here, and if you're seeing this ad, it's because I want to help you. If you're a married man who owns a business but struggle to overcome those late night vices that you're trying to hide from the world, including your wife, clients, and colleagues, whether it's drinking, drugs, overeating, or viewing filth on your phone, all these vices that you're trying to hide, you know they're killing you on the inside, plus crippling your business and failing your family. 
If you're ready to destroy vice and dominate life, then click the link in this YouTube ad. Because for the first time in my 17 years on YouTube, I have a program that not only makes men strong, but has the power to fix families, repair businesses, and restore faith in a world gone wild. But it all starts with men like you who are ready to take action. Now, I don't have enough time to explain how it works here in this short clip, which is why I put together a four minute video for you to watch on exactly how it works. So click the link here, watch the video now, it's completely free. And if you're ready to destroy vice and dominate life, be the man that you're called to be, I'll see you on the inside. Done. Yeah, um, well, I, I didn't quite put it that way, but what, what we're dealing with here in marriage is the marriage law. So, right. and in, in combination with the domestic violence laws, which have been created since uh, the 1980s or early 1980s, I think they started, or might have been early 1990s. I can't remember exactly. But these laws have been drastically overhauled, such that now a woman's word is all that's needed often to put you in jail. Now, it doesn't matter to a sense how good your relationship is, because in all likelihood, and, and this may apply to even the majority of men, their wives aren't going to pull that trigger, right. but they have that gun. Mm -hmm. They've been given that gun. They've, it's been loaded for them, and all they have to do if they decide to, is pull that trigger, you know? And if we examined the, let's, let's compare this to slavery, uh, not that, well, I, I'm not a slave expert, but I, let's just say, not all slave owners abuse their slaves. Right. But, but, that, but that they didn't doesn't make slavery any better. Mm. They could have. They could have legally abused their slaves right to the point of beating them to death. Even the best of slave owners had that right. And now we put that same right to a sense, not obviously it's not exactly the same, but we've put a similar kind of power into the hands of women. You know, they just a woman just has to call nine one one and all of the all of the power of society comes to her back and aims their guns at you. How is that different than when you mentioned in the past, if a man was found to be a wife beater, that the other men would come and, you know, lay it, lay licks down on him? Yeah, I mean, it is similar. <laughs> it's similar. It's just that now it's the law. Yeah. You know, back then it wasn't legal for men to do that. It was never legal. You know, they were like, and, and I doubt that that happened every single time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just uh, saying that there are examples where that did happen, mm -hmm. you know. And then, uh, for instance, that fella Emmett Till, uh, this is the case of a young boy who, did, who turns out was innocent. Yeah, are you you're familiar with the name? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Emmett Till, yeah, he was, I think, beaten to death uh, because he was accused of being um, by a woman, uh, a white woman. In this case, it's a racial, who was racially... Uh, Forward meeting as well, but you, you could have equally been um, in more extreme examples. It could be related to the same issue we're talking about, male female. But uh, a woman, a white woman, accused him of some kind of unsavory behavior towards her. Not rape, but uh, maybe it was rape. I can't remember the details. But a posse of of, uh, of people beat this young boy who was about I think thirteen or fifteen years old, literally to death. Yeah. So, you know, living as domestic slaves in a way, uh, where you mentioned that if, you know, if she does, if you don't take her on a expensive vacation or uh, don't remodel the kitchen for the third time, uh, the, a lot of this was, you know, I guess if the corporations are, are unfolding this one world government, that economics have a lot to do with it. Yeah. yeah. So it's a bad I'm getting a lot of decisions. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, there is that. I mean, yeah. I mean, for a long time, I think uh, probably ever since the beginning of advertising, advertisers have realized that uh, uh, discretionary income is is uh, mostly spent by women. And so, so many ads are, are targeting target women, you know. And, 
and it makes sense because um, first of all, if you are not, if the money just comes into the house and you don't have to do anything for it, what do you care how much something costs? You know, ah, right. I even worked with a guy whose wife was actually uh, quite demanding, and uh, and he just couldn't resist anything she asked for. And he ended up working for his last day. Yeah. And he didn't seem to have much to, to show for it other than, you know, he claimed to love his wife. Which is fine. Uh, but at the end of the day, I don't, I don't care what people do in their private marriages as long mm-hmm. as it's not criminal. But uh, I do object to uh, one party having the verbal, the power of their, their word to destroy the other party's life. That, that is an inherent relationship. That's not doesn't mean that's not to be male, female, black, white, whatever it is. You take one class of people and you say their word can destroy the life of this other class of people, and you've got a master slave relationship there. That is the nature of a, a master slave relationship. And it doesn't matter if the master never uses that power. They have it. And that right. plays in a lot of men's mind, the back of their mind. Yeah. You know, especially Especially as you get past your best years of life and you've accumulated something and you're facing the, you know, maybe your marriage isn't going so well, mm-hmm. right? But you're going to end up, I, I know men in this exact situation, okay, yeah. I'm not making this up. They will not, they will do, they will keep their mouth shut. And their biggest fear is that their wife will want a divorce and they'll lose everything and for all their lives. They don't have the energy to, to start over and rebuild that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it it's tough, man. Uh, you know, because of course this is uh, this is a strike against the family reproduction. I think a part of their plan is to depopulate the planet, and so you know we're not marrying, we're not reproducing, we're all sterile, uh, and it and even you know I, me and my wife are doing fine, but anything could happen, and so I was watching your video today, and I was thinking, I'm such a I'm sort of a psychopath myself. And I was like, if I if that happened, if we got into that situation, I would just burn everything down and just take burn it down it with me. I'll just burn it all down. I'll take all the money. I'll just give it away, and then I'll light a match and burn the house, blow up the car, well, you know put in jail. It's like you get nothing. <laughs> and maybe your wife knows that, so she's not going to divorce you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We both we're both going down. They're both psychopaths. If we go down, we go down together. <laughs> yeah. So what is it you like this next? Uh, sorry, you're gonna like this, like this next video that Janice. I I'm, I published the video for Janice Premium. I'm not sure if you're familiar with your mm-hmm. her or your audience is, but uh, we've been doing um, mm-hmm. active feminist or feminist critical and cultural commentary videos for about a decade now, and this next one you're going to find very interesting touches exactly on this feminist uh, attack of, of males globally. And it's uh, dealing with the, the UN and the UNICEF and the UN, UN women, uh, segment of the UN, and how they are undermining family everywhere in the world, including the poorest of countries. Rather than pr- providing services like clean water, and sanitation, and uh, agriculture, they're convincing uh, they're trying to convince governments of the world to focus on educating only women, right? Uh, supporting only women, and encouraging women to be dissatisfied within their marriages. Right. This is everywhere, and this is how they. This is when feminists first got into the university systems in 1970. That was the first thing they went after. Is the family, you know, right. men? Of course, they've always been after men. You know, they always yeah. hate. So what is the defense against this? Like, you know, starting first for the individual man, right? Uh, We do love women. Uh, We would appreciate a good relationship and a family. I think most men in their heart at some point may want that, but the risks and how do you protect yourself? Well, there are ways to protect yourself, you know? And and first of all, I'm not... uh, I, I'm sympathetic with the male I deeply understand their motivation. Yeah, for doing what they do. Sure, but the, to truly be a MGTOW monk is a huge sacrifice. Yeah, you know, and and it, and there's a price to pay for that sacrifice. You're not going to have a chance to express these deep 
attachment feelings. You're not going to get the feedback with a woman who actually does love you. You know, these are deeply important part, aspects of life that they are deciding are not worth the risk. So this is huge. And, and they're not going to pursue having their own children. And I could say this, that with all those risks out there, it is still a huge sacrifice to forego a truly positive, intimate relationship with the opposite sex or with the same sex. I'm not familiar with the the uh, homosexual uh, uh, relationships so much. So I'm going to stick to what I know. Uh, you know, I'm heterosexual, and I feel that the heterosexual relationship, for sure, and I suspect there's things. But it, to be with someone that you truly feel strongly about and, and you get that feedback from them, you see it in their eyes and their face, that they truly feel strongly about you. That is a very, it's a very deeply positive uh, human experience that I think is that, that most people should have a chance and try. So, but uh, having said that, the risks involved are huge. So, the, and other people have suggested things like, you know, make sure the woman has more to lose than you do. So marry somebody richer, you know, or go after somebody richer than you. She's less likely to go be tempted. Yeah, she's less likely to respect you also. <laughs> That's it. I'm not saying this is perfect. <laughs> but uh, I also did a video called Husbands 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, and that one deals with two radically different options for men to satisfy their urge to procreate, uh, which I think is an important urge. Um, you know, apart from whatever you might think of religiously in that, in that sense. But uh, I, I, I just believe at the end of the day, I understand, I sympathize with the MGTOW movement, but I think that the sacrifices that you make to go down that road are very, very high, and that there are ways to mitigate the risks of pursuing an intimate relationship with a woman and having your own family. Mitigate, I say, not eliminate. <laughs> right. There's nothing in life, and there's nothing at all in life that is risk-free. The risk, even, there's risks associated with going to You know, there's the risk of being profoundly unsatisfied with your life at the end when you realize that, you know, I never had a chance to raise my own kids. Or I never had a truly intimate relationship with another human being. That's a risk. Yeah, and to I mean, what end? There is a crossing. Sorry. And to what end? You know, I think about uh, you know the monks that left Rome, uh, uh, the Benedictines, and so forth, and they became MGTOW in essence, but to give their lives to God. And it seems as if uh, if it's absent from that, it's maybe a little shallow like to what ends like am i just living for myself so i can yeah, i'm not sure you know especially if you're not contributing to society or just kind of loafing around to what end yeah i think exactly and there's some people that that think that the hedonist lifestyle is the end of itself right uh i don't think that's very satisfying like as a, as a full for a full life i mean i get you i indulge in some I like to indulge in some drinks. I like to indulge in a lot of very hedonistic like things. I just don't think that that makes a whole life. You know. Mm -hmm. So uh what are your thoughts on this attack? Of course, you know, one world government, we're we're probably talking communism. Uh I, I think it's they're they're united. And the attack against gender, sexuality, uh, the family, as an attack against God and it being an atheistic movement. Right. That's a big, big old question there. Uh, I, I do have a video coming up shortly. I've done three videos in the to topic of atheism versus theism and God. First one was uh, atheism is untenable. The second one was... Um, the fraud of neo atheism. The third one uh, might displease some people in the religious people, and it's called the problem mm -hmm. with fundamentalism. Because I think there are some inherent problems of literalistic thinking with respect to God. 
And the next one that I'm just uh, trying to finish up uh, is called uh, God, Where is the Evidence? And it addresses this question that atheists always bring up, uh, which is when you talk about God, they will ask you to say, where is the evidence? So, um, and, and the reason I give this backdrop is that the question of um, God and sexuality and all that, this is, it is part of that whole question of uh, atheism versus does God, well, the question is, does God exist? You know, this is a more fundamental question. And then if you can get beyond that question, I think, well, I'm getting a little confusing here, but uh, the pursuit or else the contemplation of the question, does God exist, gets you into that role of then what would, how does God exist? Or what way do we know God? Or how do we know God? So knowing God is kind of what you're talking about when you talk about uh, uh, the relationship with the sexual, our sexual present day liberties, I guess you'd call, or our express, <laughs> sexual expression versus um, what, how it relates to our uh, our religious belief systems or our system of meaning and purpose in our lives. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, I'm curious because we look at, so for example, in Islamic countries, from what I understand, they're also being, they're getting an onslaught of feminism as well. But, you know, holding strong to the Abrahamic tradition of God created the man and woman. And uh, we understand that we're built for one another and we are different, but we have roles that complement one another and that it's better that we stay within our lanes and live in that way. It's, it's also supported by natural law, but here in the, in the West, I, I would say that we've become much more materialistic, much more atheistic. And as a result, we've almost looked at Genesis as sort of a fairy tale. Well, it's like, well, God made men and women, but that doesn't matter because God doesn't exist. So we can kind of do what we want. Would you say that religion would play a role in the healing of this split? Um, I kind of agree with uh, Thomas Berry, who was a Jesuit, uh, no, sorry, a passionist priest. And he uh, talked al along the, uh, the issue of where, why our religions, our churches, our religions of the world are in such disarray today why is it why is there such a say um denial of god you might say um and his uh, view is that uh our religions our traditional religions are failing that to the extent that um they are sinking uh, they can't deal with the modern world as well as they once did when the time when they were they were first uh, come, kind of crafted, you know, they first came to be. So he advocates for putting aside sacred texts for X number of years to reevaluate, um, not reevaluate, but reimagine what we know, what I can know, and how to approach God. Um, so, for instance, uh, this is kind of one of the the topics that's going to be presented in this, this where is the evidence video that I'm coming out with. Um, the scientific revolution, it was so successful, you know, in creating uh, things for us in the world. You know, it everywhere we look, we see the success of our scientific method, scientific purpose. Uh, but here's the thing. The scientific method begins with the exclusion of God. Scientific method uh, treats as a presumption the universe as a mechanical object. So all questions of meaning and purpose are excluded from science. Mm -hmm. You know, to, before you start your first science experiment, before the first application of the scientific method, uh, God was explicit. The pursuit of God, the idea of God, uh, everything about that you might say is God, 
is excluded from the the whole process. So, uh, whereas the pursuit of God, in, even in the traditions, is to look inward. You find God by introspection. And uh, I would I deal with the with Descartes, uh, his uh, his famous um, philosophy essay, book, whatever you want to call it, in which he rationalized uh, how do I know I exist, or he rationalized that I think, therefore I am, which he then condensed in his meditations to I am, I exist. And what he was pointing at there, and there's other philosophers that have expanded upon this, that did, um, you can't prove with evidence that you, even you exist. You will never prove with evidence that God exists. You can't even prove with evidence that you exist. Those questions are qualitative questions, whereas evidence only applies to quantitative style questions. So the, the, when you get back to Descartes and the origins of uh, most of the religions, uh, in the book of Exodus, for instance, I touch on this in the, the new essay of Paul, when God talks to Abraham, and Abraham asks, who am I going to say sent? And uh, God says, I am that I am, or I am what I am. Right. So tell the people that I am sent you. And this is exactly what Descartes said, or Descartes reasoned with pure reason. Okay, pure reason is a valid way of knowing. It's a philosophically valid way of coming to know things through pure reason. Whereas, um, and that, that falls into empirical knowledge. You know, empirical knowledge is experiential knowledge, whereas it goes to objective knowledge, which is evidential knowledge. But in any case, I'm getting, I'm getting kind of into it too much here. Right? Stop me if you will. Uh, to say that, uh, that Descartes came up with the same kind of proclamation is that I am through reason implies, and, and the same thing happened through Hindu religions, for instance. Uh, in Hindu, Brahma exists. Brahma is God, and he makes the universe out of himself. So that Brahma is I am, the universe is I exist, I am, I exist. You know. So the way to know God is then not uh, to, is you, you can't know God through trying to do scientific experiments with evidentiary uh, uh, proof. Right. The way to know God is to, to, uh, to go inward and know yourself. And through knowing yourself, you know God. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I hear you saying a bunch of different things, one of which it sounds as if the scientific revolution has removed meaning from being. And they're two different things. And we can study being, but it has no meaning. And as a result, we, we, we're attempting to separate God and God's law being man and woman, right? We're better together. We have unique and distinct roles within a relationship and uh, being meat suits with genders that or genitals that could be interchanged at any moment. I'm, I'm sort of proposing that it's been because of the scientific revolution which has separated meaning from being that we're even allowed to fall into like god is kind of a lot given us over to our folly and to separate meaning from being means now you get to be uh a slave to the feminist world order <laughs> yeah I, I like where you're going with that uh because this whole identity movement is about picking and choosing your identities that you see outside of yourself and then kind of wearing them like clothes, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas it, your identity, your real identity, is, uh, is what you have, your, your most profound identity is what you're born with and what you need to get to know. You need to, a person, a healthy person, gets to know themselves, gets, like, the, to, the journey to understand yourself is the journey to understand who you are, your identity. Rather than do that journey in our culture, people are going out and saying, I like this part of that identity, I'll take that, I'll wear it over here, I'll put on this little hat over here, this is my this is my gender fluid hat, yeah. um, this is my, I'm going to be now a, uh, I'm going to, 
I don't know, pick one of the identities. There's so many of them out there. Most right. of them now are re- related to um, to uh, gender and sexuality, but uh, you get the, you get the point. We're we're not looking for internally for our natural identity. We're encouraging people to shock for it in the culture. Right, as superficial. Yeah, I, you know, I struggle because you know I hear you saying we turn in to know God, and that is subjective as well, right? And so, okay, I turn in to, to, to know myself, I turn in to know God, but there's a whole lot of stuff going on inside there that ain't right. <laughs> Just because I turned in don't mean I'm going to get to the truth. And I, I think I that's a, another yeah. a way of separating meaning from being, because there's you can't separate meaning from being, because there's truth in the being of a thing. And so, the like, to... to the created world is God. It's the seed of existence. Like God is a seed of of existence. And so trying to separate it is like saying the same thing. God is only inside me or what I make of it rather than, you know, I love, of course I'm Christian. And so I love the idea of an incarnate God. It's like God is showing us that he is flesh. Like he's here. He's, and he's, not just revealed himself through scripture, but through his prophets, but then also incarnating in Christ to show us that like being is divine. It's his divine eminence. And so no matter, no, no amount of turning in and deciding for myself, just like, you know, being a transgender um, can really reveal God. I think, I think there has to be an element of objectivity. Right. I think you're 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 right to uh, I I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. Uh, I think there's two elements to this. One that you're talking about is the imminent God, which is the uh, the the, birth, the born, and uh, in Christianity it's the born Christ, imminent in the world, mm. um, and one with the universe. The universe, and some people describe it as the body of Christ. So it's been described as uh, the cosmic Christ, even. So Christ being the Son of God is like Brahma, God, Brahma, creating the universe from himself. So all of the universe is imbued with, it's inseparable from Brahma. Okay, that's uh, the Hindu side of it, but it has parallels in what you're speaking to in Christianity. So there's two broad classes. You've got imminent God, and you've got um, transcendent God. So transcendent God is a, is the way is to discuss the God as separate from the universe. So independent of the universe with independent qualities yeah. and actions. Whereas imminent God is God as the universe. So the universe is God as pan- pantheus. Right. But the both are valid. And the thing is that we can say more. We can learn more, I think, about imminent God than we can about transcendent God. Because by our na- by nature, um, Transcending God is outside the universe in a sense. And we aren't. We are inside the universe. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm not discounting transcending God as God has, you know, I'm not discounting that. But I do agree that imminent God is probably a more fruitful road, at least as a first road for us to go down. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, in many ways, it's all of it, right? And so, yeah, yeah I love this conversation. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. I definitely want to. I want to bring it back though, because you know we're talking about a, attack on nature. We're talking about an na- attack on the family. We're talking about an attack on God, and this is essentially what the one world government through the feminist arm is enacting on us. And it's unfolded most potently in Western civilization. And you know, in your talk, you 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 point out how Western civilization. Has now have a it had now has a face, and it's become a racist sort of attack, and so whiteness is also a sin in this feminist world order. Correct. Mm-hmm. Well, I, that that point was talking about uh, they they began with um, Western culture, which came to represent uh, uh, patriarchy, uh, and then they turned that into white guilt sorry white privilege then it transformed this is over over a sequence of about 60 years right 
Uh, it transformed it into white privilege, then white guilt, and then they just distilled it right down to white. Okay. Now, they, the, the people who want to craft, create discord in the world, uh, they're pretty crap. Uh, you know, if you walk down the street and somebody tells you, oh, smash the patriarchy, well, you can, where are you going to find the patriarchy? You're right. walking around, there, there's no patriarchy. Even if you're going to say, well, let's tear down Western culture. And you walk down, well, everything is Western culture. Yeah, everything you see there, everybody you see there is Western culture. You're Western culture. I'm Western culture. Uh, jazz, uh, rap, uh, the music, the science, the law. Everything there is Western culture, including you. So where do you, what are you smashing? There's nothing, there's no face to snatch. But when they got it down to white, you can see white on the street. Now you have an enemy, a visible, identifiable enemy on the street. And what are we seeing? We saw this immediately with the, with the whiteness as the enemy uh, memes that came out a few years ago. We saw random attacks on white people on the street almost immediately. And then you have people, uh, gr uh, gangs and groups growing up and getting, whooping themselves up into fury. At white people. Yeah. So there is an enemy. And now you've got discord. Now you've got the people at each other's throats. And you have, see, on the other side, we, we see groups of white people starting to strike back. Uh, mm. or, or at least speak out saying things like, okay, white lives matter. Okay, that nominally is a non-controversial uh, thing to say. But it um, when it is heard, or received as black lives don't matter. Right. And so this, this is constant discord and it, it's all based on this desire to uh, tear down the feminist desire, Marxist feminist desire to tear down Western culture altogether. Yeah, I think one of the most deplorable things that I've seen unfold in these times are the self-loathing white people who, <laughs> who bend down their knee and apologize relentlessly and licking uh, boots. Even. There's yeah. videos of that licking boots. Yeah. 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 I remember watching a video, uh, Yuri Bezmenov. I spoke about him in my talk and I think he's, his ideas have become more popular now that we were post, uh, pandemic. Um, and he talks about demoralization and what it looks like, how it unfolds. And it's so evident that we're at the peak of that demoralization that you, not only do people not can't even stand up for their country, they can't stand up for their religion. They can't stand up for their, for their beliefs. They can't even stand up for themselves so much so that they lick boots. It's sad. It is, you know. I think one of the, the points I made in that video is that the uh, the U.S. Uh, needs to be weakened in order right. to bring in a one world government. The U.S. is, uh, you know, still, although I think its power is past its peak, it's still the the big boy on the block. You know, um, if the U.S. doesn't go down that road, the world doesn't go down that road. So those who want a one world government, they recognize that. You're not getting a one world government until you chop the U.S. down a few steps, you know. And uh, the left loose in power now, Biden and his buddies, they're doing everything they can to chop the U.S. down. And that's why they hated Trump so much. They absolutely despised Trump because Trump wanted to put the U.S. first, wanted to strengthen the U.S., which is his job. You know, hmm. you're... The leader of the country, good or bad, whatever you think about that country, whatever you think about nation states, the leader of the country, his job is to look after the interests of the right. country. First, doesn't mean he can't have, you can't have uh, international programs to help other countries. We're way beyond helping other countries now. We're, we are into a range, I think Canada and the U.S., to which we are um, actively uh, weakening our own countries. So you mentioned America being the last uh, bulwark against this. And of course, we're, we're falling quickly. You mentioned Trump. You know, I was a big Trump supporter. St still 
still am to a degree, but what are your thoughts on him being a controlled opposition? You know, I, I can't help but to think that, you know, maybe he's there for a reason and that the clever people in charge realize that they, and they've done this before, that they're using him. He's the puppet for controlled opposition. Uh, could that be a situation? Anything is possible. But just seeing Trump's character, I can just imagine him bristling at the thought that he's playing some game for other people. You know? <laughs> he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who's just going to bend down and say, yeah, I'll be your puppet. I'll be yeah. your uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible. You mentioned compromise as well, too. You know, that was eye-opening that, you know, if you were these people in charge, you would make sure that they're compromised and therefore they will do it. You tell them to do. Yeah. I mean, that's what the, uh, the mob says, right? Uh, you know, they get a new guy, a uh, man, a new man, uh, operative in their organization. Uh, his One of the things he has to do is uh, do some recorded and witnessed bad act like murder something right right and, and then they can trust him. before he before you know that he's murdered and been witnessed not he's not like vouched for they're not going to trust him so they have something on him now. and this is uh, i think one of the things that uh, happens at the high 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 reaches of power is that they uh, for instance there's a lot of talking about pedophilia and I, I don't know much about this whole global pedophilia ring other than the Epstein thing. It was awfully suspicious that Epstein somehow managed to hang himself with all the, I, I don't believe he did. Mm -hmm. But let's just say uh, uh, at least we know that Epstein had young girls at his island that lots of those highly powered people went to visit his island. We know these things. And they're very secretive and they make sure we don't know who we don't get many of the details but so they're protected of that but if you were um wanted to trust a i say a very exclusive clique of extremely powerful people and you had to trust each other then one of the first things that a group like that is going to do is get some kind of insurance policy on one another that they're not going to blow the whistle on the other right and what better thing than to get all of them recorded having sex with an underage girl and if one of them speaks out a line, then they just go down and they get that little video, they put it out there, and that guy is gone. He's in jail. He doesn't, he can't, nothing he says anymore is going to threaten the remaining group members. So that's, I think, what could be uh, the purpose of the whole pedophilia ring is to make sure that they have insurance policies. Right. So. You know, we're coming up on an hour here and I, I want to respect your time. I, I do have two pretty big questions, but I'd love to dive into those before we wrap up. Um, I'll spit them both out so you can kind of see where I'm going. Uh, first, what is the end game here for the world rulers? Where are they ultimately taking us and why? And then what do we do? You, you, did, you mentioned a global coalition of men that there may need to be some movement grassroots. What would that look like? So, you know, where are they taking us and how can we push back is really it. Yeah. Uh, well, where I think they're taking us, the same place they've taken every civilization that they've grasped control over is that the, what are the interests of the super powerful? One, they want a secure workforce that can't, that, that, they, that must work for them basically a slave class, one way or another. Um, so they want, and, and that's typically been for the hard labor. Uh, they want a, a one world government in which they can rule the whole world with a secure slave class, maybe a small amount of the overseer class. And uh, at the end, uh, their interest in women is harems. You know, uh, what happens when, when all of the men are emasculated because they're all under... They're all put, their status of men is put below women. Those women, all of them, uh, as you, you referred to earlier, women look up to a mate. They look upwards in status. They don't look down in status for a potential mate. If you, if the, the global powerful men 
uh, are able to and basically lower the status of all men by putting women in uh, above them and throughout every reach of society. Those women are are most of them, or a lot of those women are not going to consider those low status men. It was all of those women are going to look upward at those leaders, the powerful men. They're going to fight to be in harem with those, with those powerful men. All the most desirable women in the world, they will compete to be part of a harem. The feminists don't understand that. And women in general who, who are nonchalant about feminism, they don't understand that that's the ultimate end point, is that they're not going to have um, the mate choice that they think because of the power and stratus they have in life. They're going to be dissatisfied. They're going to, they're going to, you know, look down upon all those working class men that have no nothing to that no status in the world, and they're going to they're they're going to um, be fighting for positions in the harem. And the problem with the whole harem thing is that those men are going to send those women back to where they came from, just like the Romans did when they turned twenty five years old. It's not going to be pleasant for the women either. Right, they they will now be servants in the home that they left to try and make a go of it in harem, uh, and the, the men they're just going to be ruling the world like emperors. But they will, but it's not going to be pleasant for the men at the top either. I don't want to say that that mm. thing, they're all just a group of uh, guys hedonistically enjoying and laughing about everything in life. They will fight among each other. Just like emperors of the past have, because they just like uh, uh, mafia groups fight and uh, for status within the group, you know, it, that's there's a there's a fight at every level, right? Uh, and at the very top, they fight sometimes very smart, uh, but it's a fight nonetheless, and they are strategizing against one another all the time, as well as cooperating at times. Right now, they all know. I make the point in that, in that particular video that they are like a coalition in a sense because they know none of them can be emperor or rule or have any part ruling the world unless they actually have a one world government. You can't roll over a one a world if there isn't a one world government to rule. Right. So they, they have to cooperate. They, they kind of unconsciously know that and they're, they're all pushing in that one direction. But once they establish that, they all know they'll be fighting top uh, just like when the mafia boss is, is knocked off the next one there's blood there's blood in the street and they're all trying to gather a coalition of supporters amongst their buddies they're all trying to jostle for position there'll be some offings there'll be some 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 uh executions and there'll be some clearing of house you know it'll be a bloodbath uh, not necessarily a physical bloodbath but there will be a lot of uh fighting going on at that point. Now, I think we're ultimately going to have to deal with a one world government. You know, because it, uh, this is the first time in history where it's actually literally been possible to rule over the whole world. Right. Um, whether they succeed this time, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. They, if they don't succeed this time, or, or in my life, they're, they're not going to stop looking for it. They're not going right. to stop fighting for it. They're just going to keep going until they get it. And then it's a different story. It, 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 there'll be a time when when things are are going okay, and then it'll just start to get corrupt, and corrupt, and corrupt. It seems like Go it's extra long. just been happening that way. Uh, is this like the the this this the pattern of Babylon, like the uh, the 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 Tower of Babel, right? Like, wasn't this what we were doing thousands of years ago, as it was recorded in the Bible? Like, sort of the same thing we're just repeating. Likely. I mean, human nature hasn't changed much in a hundred thousand years. You know, no, we're we we still have within us the same cast of characters we carry around. You know, we have prophets, we have sages, we have devils, <laughs> we have uh, evil-minded people, we have uh, ambitious emperor-minded people, warriors and priests. The same cast of characters are amongst us that we've been amongst us for God knows how long, forever. But what can we do about it is another question. And I threw out there the idea that a global union of men, which is, you know, obviously a pretty ambitious <laughs> project. <Yeah. laughs> oh, I don't know if it can be achieved, but um, 
yeah. or even but but maybe even just the idea of trying uh, could lead to groups of men and it's not like we haven't had that in the past you know there have been a sense as, as essentially unions of men in the past we call them other names like um uh, what are they that the masons uh freemasons you know it's basically a union of freemasons and they took on larger roles you have the the, the knighthoods and uh, various things, you know that uh, decided that they would come together and form a bond based on common interests and common commitment. We need something like that, I think. Uh, or and even if we don't, I, I think ultimately the long game is that the one world government's going to come. It's going to ride out its time. It's going to, at the end, the end of it, it's going to be incredibly brutal. It's going to be incredibly miserable for incredibly large numbers of people. But ultimately, if even if there's no uh, League of Men, for instance, doing anything about it, it will crumble under the weight of some corruption eventually, like all huge unopposed societies do. And that's the problem with the one world government, is that there's no opposition. And it's opposition. As, you're, you're an athlete, okay? Uh, it's your enemy that makes you strong. Right. You know, it's your enemy that brings the best out of you. Without an enemy, you you turn to hedonistic, slothful, uh, uh, angry, kind of un, unfocused, unpurposed misery. It, there's a it, there's even a a term for this the uh, the sacred enemy. And like, you know, both sides, you make your enemy stronger and your enemy makes you stronger. And, and I'm using the word enemy in the broadest possible sense. It's basically a, a, an opposing force, right? Two countries, you know, uh, struggling to, for maybe not dominance in the world necessarily, but even just struggling to, for their economy to be better, their people to be better than the other. They riot, they bring each other up. Even with the competition, they bring each other up. Right. I played sports. You know, there comes a point when when you're when you're getting better at your particular game, and you're playing all of you. You don't have enough competition. In order to continue to get better, you need better competition, or you were just raw. You just you just kind of rot at that level. Yeah. So a one world government will bring us into that. There's, there's, no, there's no competition. There's no outside force to keep the government on us. Yeah. I, you, you did have a warning earlier, and we've spoken about fundamentalism. I'm curious what your thoughts are on, uh, you know, end time prophecy and like, does Jesus come back and uh, will there be a chastisement? And does this all end with God opposing us? That's a huge topic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm not a, uh, a literal uh, Bible believer. I, I, I believe that uh, I'm believing God, and I'm going to try to the best of my ability to explain myself in this next up upcoming video, which is nominally uh, called uh, God, Where is the Evidence? Um, and that's in response to the question often posed by atheists, where is your evidence for God? Mm -hmm. okay. um, but... Um, does Christ come back? Uh, I guess that question depends what you mean by Christ. You referred to uh, cosmic Christ, or I put the word cosmic Christ out there, but you kind of inferred to that idea of Christ, the imminent Christ in the universe. You know, to a sense, if, if Christ is to come back, to my way of thinking, it would be this, that spirit of Christ within each person, however you understand it, rising to the surface and expressing itself through each one of us, uh, the, that kind of best side of ourselves, if you will, that uh, the reflection of Christ within each person, rising to the surface, increasing, so that almost an army of Christ rising in the world. You know? But I don't envisage a Christ, a uh, transcendent Christ, coming to earth and you know fixing all our problems. 
works. No, I would, if there's, if there's a rise of Christ, I would visit it as that internal reflection of the cosmic Christ within every person, God within every person, rising to the surface in response to the, adver uh, the uh, adverse situation presented. So bringing the best out of each person and that becoming a wave of uh, good, maybe you could say, or at least resistance to the evil <laughs> that's yeah. rising. Yeah. If what you're saying is true, it almost seems as if that's happening now. I I'm watching how traditionalist movements in the faith are rising, they're growing. So many people are having experiences of God in Christ and are returning to the faith. I read an article about Berlin being, you know, thoroughly athe atheistic as it has been, uh, all of a sudden have seen a huge rise in traditional Catholicism. However, it's going to look tangibly, you know, imminent. Um, there seems to be something rising up in the hearts and minds of men today. And uh, maybe it's what you're saying. It's the Christ is rising in their, in their hearts. It could be. I mean, that's uh, uh, it's not a far-fetched idea because, you know, there is a kind of almost a natural opposition of forces in the world that kind of, you know, as evil rises, well, the response is to, like, for good, say, to come, or the best side of people to come up and say, you know, this is not right. We're going to oppose it. And as the whole thing rises, one one to the other, there comes a climax. <laughs> there has to come a climax, right? If both are rising in tension and power, or tension and power, they're going to come a time when, okay, we got to put an end to this. We let, we're going to have it out, you know? Yeah, interesting. Steve, thank you so much, man. This has been a lot of fun. Very enlightening. Uh, great conversation. Let us know where we can learn about all these great videos you're putting out and um, anything else that you got going on, brother. Studio B on YouTube. Uh, that's uh, Studio Space B. You might have to... My original channel, Studio Berlay, was deleted when I talked about uh, ivermectin during the yeah. uh, pandemic. Uh, but those videos are on uh, Studio Berlay at odyssey.com. And uh, the new channel, which is Studio B on YouTube, those videos are also backed up on rumble.com, Studio Berlay. So um, the new ones right now uh, are going on to Studio B. Tomorrow, the one about the uh, uh, feminism, the infiltration or use of the United Nations, UNICEF, to spread, rather than spread the healthy things to the needy countries of the world, to spread ideological feminism. Right. Uh, that's coming out tomorrow, and that's a really interesting one. Uh, I would highly recommend you do that. That's my Janice game angle. Good. Uh, okay. And my next one on uh, uh, God, where is the evidence? That should be in about a week or so. Awesome. You know, B. I was looking for your channel. I didn't realize it was deleted. And I, I searched Steve Brule. And apparently there's like a comedian or something. So I got a bunch of yeah. like, I got a bunch of like joke channels and I was like, oh, what is this? And so, you know, I had to go and do a little digging, but thank you. I don't know nope. why that, that's from O'Reilly. Uh, it, it's not Charles O'Reilly. I forget his name now. He's a comedian and he created a character called Dr. Steve Brule. I don't know why he came up with that name. I never, I never met the guy. Yeah, well, Studio B, we'll go look for it, man. And uh, we look forward to the new videos, brother. Thank you so You much. might have to put in Fia Mengo when you put in Studio B because uh, there's a lot of Studio Bs out there. The new channel only has about five or 6,000 subscribers. Well, I'll be sure to link to it. Okay, round three. Yeah, so it'll be easy for people to find. All right, well, enjoy the rest of your day, my man, and uh, hopefully we'll link up again soon. Thank you so much, Elliot. Bye.